Thanks for joining us today at the Family Research Council for our panel event on the Obergefell case one year later. About a year ago, the Supreme Court constitutionalized and declared that same-sex marriage was protected under the Constitution. This ruling followed cultural trends that had been developing for decades. Nevertheless, the case itself had a major impact on society and our view and acceptance as a culture of same-sex marriage. We're going to discuss some different implications of this ruling today, some areas the case has impacted matters both more explicitly and implicitly. Uh, with us today, we have Dr. Paul Sullins from Catholic University. He's a renowned sociologist and a scientist who studies the family in a way that's far deeper and more um, in a more expert manner than I could ever do being a lawyer myself. And so we're going to ask him to comment on the ruling's impact on the family. Also with us is Mark Tooley. Uh, he's going to discuss some of the impact on the church and issues uh, theologically related to uh, the church's relation to a culture which now approves of and accepts same-sex marriage. Uh, I'm going to discuss some of the legal implications uh, as the third slot on this panel. And after that, we will um, take some questions and answers and have time for you all to, to raise your concerns and questions with us. So thanks for being here again. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sullins. Oh, good afternoon. It's an uh, honor and pleasure to be here. Um, uh, the uh, implications of the Obergefell de decision for the family, um, I, I think probably one of the best places to begin to address that question would be in the uh, dissents uh, written in Obergefell to this decision itself, particularly uh, Justice Roberts' dissent. Uh, and in his dissent, uh, he said that uh, what Obergefell does is not establish new equalities or new rights with regard to marriage, but that it actually changes the core meaning of marriage uh, for American jurisprudence and maybe for American culture generally. Um, and he, he doesn't um, go into that too deeply, but he quotes uh, Cicero and he quotes uh, James Q. Wilson, a modern social scientist, uh, both to the effect that uh, marriage is a central institution in society uh, that it forms because human beings um, uh, are creatures that have uh, instinctive sexual attractions. You may know that. Uh, but the attraction that we have to one another sexually does not, uh, is not usually followed by an equally strong desire to care for uh, the consequences that often result from sex relations, that is, children. And so you have people who have strong impulses to engage in sexual activity, not so strong impulses to raise the children that come from that. And so the um, social arrangement or institution that ha has developed from time immemorial to handle that is something that is recognizable as marriage. Uh, it applies social bonds um, and social sanctions to make up for what nature lacks uh, so that children have some chance uh, of being cared for by the ones who brought them into this world. Um, and that has uh, taken different forms in different societies, but that has been more or less the core purpose or meaning of marriage. And according to Justice Roberts, Obergefell changed that. And that was a far more radical change with regard to marriage than some of the other changes that had happened, all of the other changes that had happened uh, in American jurisprudence uh, to that point, such as the, the uh, uh, removal of uh, coverture or um, <coughs> uh, uh, laws uh, against miscegenation or, or other things that had restricted marriage, it, it, they did not touch this core understanding and definition of marriage. Um, so if we go back to um, the middle of the 20th century, um, we, we often date it to the 1960s, it kind of started a little bit before that, but um, where we have the so-called sexual revolution and we have the beginning of uh, uh, modern changes to marriage, uh, we could um, uh, trace a trend uh, where we have moved from an institution that is uh, 
more or less centered on the care of children uh, to an institution that is more or less centered on the fulfillment of adults. And that's, that would be, I would identify as the kind of root fundamental change in marriage that's taken place over the last couple of generations. Obergefell was another step in that trend. It was certainly not the first step in that trend. So you had, beginning in the 1960s, uh, and earlier really, uh, women moving uh, into the workforce in far greater numbers than before. Um, well, I tend to think that's a good thing uh, in many ways, but in one way that it's not a good thing is that it made life a little more precarious for the children uh, that were in the care of married couples at that time. And so we had the, the rise of, uh, you know, latchkey children, if you remember that, and children who were um, unsupervised for long periods of time, uh, where the uh, care of the mother was not uh, something that could be depended upon. You had the diminishing of many civic arrangements and civic associations that depended upon the um, availability of women to uh, uh, organize them and to keep them going. And so you had a, a, the beginnings of some negative consequences uh, for the family uh, at that time. Um, you had the uh, well-known um, dismantling or reduction of uh, the strength of the African-American family uh, it, it starting in the mid-20th century. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, a, c a controversial um, uh, policy debate, but there was no question that something had happened uh, where black children couldn't depend upon a strong family with a strong uh, man and woman bond, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, bond in place, uh, a trend that continues uh, to this day. Then we had the rise of uh, 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 two things, uh, divorce and uh, increasingly children born what we would have called then out of wedlock, build, uh, outside of the institution of marriage. So if you think of marriage as something that collects all these things together, that binds a man and a woman and cares them for their children, what you see is the beginning of uh, the unbundling or the dismantling, or if you want to really sound um, like you're an educated academic, you would say the deconstruction of uh, the institution of marriage. Uh, and so um, you have um, persons who say, well, I, I want to have children, but I don't want to bother with being married. So you have, and, and, and that be diminishes the institution of marriage. Children in those arrangements, uh, despite the um, maybe integrity and good intentions of the people involved in doing that, ty uh, typically do not get as much care or the quality of care that children uh, get in a, what, it, what by now we would have to call a traditional uh, or natural or religious-based understanding of marriage. Um, then you had the rise of divorce. Uh, it, it divorce, when it first came in, in the early 1970s, was hailed as a, a new wave of liberation for men and women in troubled, conflictual marriages, and that children would benefit from this. And uh, after two decades of research, uh, it, uh, it's quite clear that exactly the opposite is the case. That we, we have now a, a generation or two that has been traumatized by the divorce of their parents uh, that uh, uh, seem to uh, wander around trying to find their way into uh, healthy relationships themselves. Um, who uh, we, we know today that um, divorce, uh, having parents who are divorced, diminishes the quality of life, not just for children when they're young, but throughout the whole life's lifespan. Higher mortality at almost any age in the lifespan for children whose parents have been divorced compared to those who have uh, been together. Uh, and so then we have, of course, you, you know very well, the, the rise of the trend of avoiding marriage altogether, uh, premarital or extramarital cohabitation. Uh, and so it's another reduction of the um, benefits of marriage. Now, cohabitation sounds great, but it's great for the adults. Cohabitations typically end when a child appears. And at that point, they're either upgraded to a marriage, a more shaky marriage than if there had been no cohabitation, or 
they uh, split up altogether, and you can go into single parent arrangements from that point. Um, and so I, I could go on and on about the different steps in this trend, but you see the trend. And so if you now call a relationship that cannot be reproductive, a marriage, you're taking the next step. Remember, uh, uh, Cicero said that the premise of marriage was that uh, a man and a woman tend to be reproductive. And because of that, uh, this institution formed. Now we have, we're calling marriage something which is not only uh, degrades reproduction or shortens it or, or somehow um, ma makes it less fulsome like um, women in the workforce or um, uh, cohabitation or now we have a form of relationship that cannot be reproductive and we're calling that as marriage uh, and so some people have said well that's that's the most extreme step of dismantling marriage um, well it, I, it would almost be hopeful as if that was true I, I'm not sure what the next step will be uh, but I, I think that uh, that's the trend that we're in uh, and that's what Obergefell has kind of um, accentuated for us, uh, and that's a situation where we are today, sociologically speaking. Thank you, Dr. Sellens. Uh, before we move on, I just want have, I want to uh, provide one follow-up question, mm -hmm. have you address it um, before we proceed. I often hear the objection uh, from people uh, when discussing this issue, they say, well, how does this affect me? I really don't see the harm. I don't see how it affects me. It may affect those people, but not me, um, and, and they're apathetic or they don't care about it, so how would you address that objection? Sure. Um, I, a couple of a couple of points that I'd make. Um, and, and, and first, uh, of course, if, if this person is uh, um, old enough to have lived before the uh, uh, some of these trends in marriage, you'd have to say, well, they d they they don't affect you because you were fortunate enough to grow up at a time before they had occurred. So that's the first thing. Um, but if you look at younger people today, you see lots of effects. Uh, very few young people. Um, have any notion of um, r restraining from sexual relations before marriage, uh, not entering into cohabitation. Um, they struggle to understand what marriage is and, and what it involves. Uh, that's a result of this trend. Uh, and that's probably going to uh, be accentuated uh, if we go further down this road. So that's the first answer. The second answer is that um, y you know, I if someone is not in the care of same-sex parents, then of course they're not going to be personally affected by that. Uh, but I have studied intensely the children who are in the care of same-sex parents, uh, and they do not thrive uh, on many measures nearly as much as children who are in the care of men and women parents. Um, there is there is a direct uh, negative effect uh, on the on those children. Um, so I, I don't have the full answer to that. That's an interesting question. Um, uh, but um, uh, those are two points that I would make. Thank you. We'll have time for questions uh, after uh, we conclude here. But um, just make sure to make a note of those or jot them down. We'll be sure to address them. Uh, next, we're going to have a, a, a little presentation from Mark Tooley. Mark's the president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy. They're an organization that does a lot of great things in many areas, and their focus is really on the protection of Christian orthodoxy, small o orthodoxy, as it impacts public life. Uh, and so, Mark, uh, I'm going to allow him a few minutes to talk about the impact of this ruling on the church. Uh, Mark, please. Uh, We're happy to hear from you now. Yes, thank you, Travis. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you all. I confess up front, I still have trouble pronouncing the name of the Supreme Court's uh, marriage ruling, mm. so I carefully avoid saying it. I'll just uh, call it the ruling. <laughs> and uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, but I was asked to address the question of how uh, the ruling has affected uh, America's uh, churches, and uh, my answer is essentially not much and a great deal, and so I'll try to explain that in about uh, 10 minutes, uh, if you'll indulge me. Almost all of official Christianity continues in the U.S. and around the world, continues to disapprove same-sex marriage and affirm sex only within male-female marriage. No major church body has changed their stance since the court ruling and none are likely in the near future. Several declining old line denominations had already abandoned traditional Christian teaching uh, well before the ruling. Uh, they are, of course, uh, most of you probably already know, uh, the Episcopal Church, uh, the Presbyterian Church USA, 
the United Church of Christ, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, uh, plus the Christian Church uh, Disciples of Christ. Uh, they collectively represent uh, maybe 5% uh, or less of American church members and are fast declining. Their example should be instructed to others who might be tempted to follow their example. There is, to my knowledge, no Christian denomination in the world that has abandoned uh, the marriage teaching that wasn't already declining and did not suffer further and usually accelerating decline afterwards. Uh, in the United States, uh, the three largest religious bodies affirm only uh, traditional marriage. Uh, they are the Roman Catholic Church, the Southern Baptist Convention, and the United Methodist Church. Uh, the latter, uh, the Methodist, of course, surprises many because it's the uh, largest historically uh, liberal old-line Protestant uh, denomination. Uh, but its membership, unlike the others, is global, and its growing and soon-to-be uh, majority overseas African membership has kept it orthodox uh, to the exasperation of many American liberals. The United Methodist Church even has an official stance affirming laws in civil society defining marriage as the union of man and woman. America's uh, largest religious demographic overall is um, evangelicals. Uh, there is a growing evangelical left that's embarrassed by Christianity's and specifically evangelicalism's countercultural teachings, especially on sex. In the evangelical left mythology, Christianity without serious sexual restrictions would be more inclusive, more welcoming, and therefore more evangelistically successful. These voices are typically uh, uninformed about or just ignore the old line Protestant example, even as they advocate that evangelicalism become more like the fading Episcopal Church. A growing number of um, events targeting young evangelical elites try to ignore or minimize traditional Christian teaching about marriage. A recent social justice convo hosted by a major evangelical uh, organization uh, unusually included a, a Southern Baptist leader who briefly defended a traditional um, marriage teaching. There was a negative reaction by some in the room and by many on social media who thought even this brief reference was offensive. They forgot or preferred to ignore that the official host group uh, has an official teaching defining marriage as only the union of male and female. Some otherwise orthodox and sensible orthodox uh, older evangelical leaders uh, believe their social relevance and evangelistic success requires at least downplaying Christian marriage teaching. They maybe underestimate their audience uh, and the power of uh, their message. Uh, Washington, D.C., for example, like uh, many other American urban areas with increasing numbers of young professionals, has experienced an unprecedented church planning boom in recent years. Dozens, uh, and more likely scores, of new congregations, all, almost all of them evangelical, with official stances for traditional marriage, are um, affirming um, very clearly the uh, traditional understanding of marriage. And yet, um, uh, they succeed in attracting uh, thousands of young people to these churches, many of whom are themselves um, socially liberal and um, supportive of or at least comfortable with same-sex marriage. And yet, ironically, uh, Washington, D.C., like most large urban areas, has dozens and dozens of uh, beautiful old sanctuaries belonging to uh, old-line denominations that affirm same-sex marriage and proudly wave their rainbow flags, and yet are almost completely bereft of uh, young people and have no success in attracting uh, young people. So why is that? Uh, my own uh, theory is that uh, among uh, uh, other reasons, uh, young people, like most people, uh, when they seek out a religion, whether it's Christianity or otherwise, in religion, uh, they're not looking for a buddy who whispers into their ear what they want to hear, but in fact, they're looking for a mature parent who tells them what they know they need to hear. Polls are often trumpeted showing that majorities of self-identified Catholics and Old Latin Protestants, plus a large minority of evangelicals, favor same-sex marriage. Yet closer examination almost always shows that actively church-going adherents are much more traditional. Many secularists assumed in their historically determinist way uh, that uh, the court ruling uh, would ensure that uh, religion, along with the rest of society, would fold into the new uh, sexual zeitgeist. They should be and will be disappointed as orthodox religion remains mostly outside this supposed consensus. In some cases, the court ruling arguably has strengthened Christian witness by amplifying the difference between secular civil society and the church's unchanging transgenerational universal teaching. The contrast for some is motivating and evangelistically helpful. To become a Christian is now more dramatically to enter into a new kind of society with a very different and a more permanent transcendent authority. In this spirit, some have wished good riddance to uh, what they call Christendom and uh, Christian America. Others are comfortable with traditional standards for the church, 
uh, but to also with permissive definitions for wider civil society. These assumptions might be dangerous in some cases and are at odds, I think, with traditional Christian social teaching about reforming wide society as a means of grace and an expression of divine love. The Christian understanding of marriage as lifelong voluntary union of equal male and female, mirroring Christ's union with his church, and rooted in universal natural law has been a gift to all cultures where more destructive and exploitative alternatives have often prevailed across the centuries and millennia. However, unpopular and politically untenable in uh, our current context, Christians and other traditionalists cannot abandon our understanding that natural marriage is not just for religious communities, but is for the good of all human society. This understanding will be especially important in the days ahead in the inevitable debates about polygamy and other innovations that will flow from the court's ruling. Thanks, Mark. Um, before I, I jump into my remarks, to, uh, and you sort of addressed this, but how would you uh, succinctly answer an objection or a question about, well, it's not loving to oppose same-sex marriage or I have friends um, who are, who are uh, entering into these relationships. It's not loving to oppose them, and Christians are, are to be about love. So how would you answer that if you're, if you're talking with someone? Well, uh, obviously, uh, the Christian understanding of love is adherence uh, to uh, the scriptures and uh, the historic uh, church teaching and to uh, modestly understand that we ourselves as uh, individuals uh, don't have the ultimate authority to decide what's loving and, and what's not loving, and that uh, we, refer to, we defer to uh, the wider community whose definition of love, I think, has been verified uh, across the, the centuries and across uh, the millennia, and which includes uh, uh, the definition of, of natural marriage. Thanks. And we'll have, like I said before, you know, we'll have more opportunity to discuss some of these things as I conclude. I'm just going to briefly... Um, and just uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Travis Weber. I'm director of the Center for Religious Liberty here at the Family Research Council. We focus on a number of issues as we advocate for religious liberty, both domestically and overseas, protecting this right for those of all faiths. I mean, in all contexts, when the right arises, a robust definition that we want to see protected as an individual right, human right around the world. Part of that is in the context of sexuality and marriage, the ability of the Christian to continue to exercise their faith and live it out in all aspects of their lives is going to be important and increasingly important post Obergefell uh, as the Supreme Court ruled last year. So the Supreme Court uh, ruled that constitutionally states cannot deny a license to two people of the same sex uh, and they must recognize such licenses from other states, such marriages from other states. That's what the ruling held. That's the direct legal implication of the ruling. And that's the only um, requirement, legal, hard legal requirement, that must be implemented as a result of that ruling. Yet, if you look at the news uproar and ruckus that we've seen in our culture over the last year, um, you'd, you'd obviously understand that things haven't gone away. This hasn't really resolved many of the issues that continue to underlie um, the debates we're seeing. Um, so, so obviously there's more here, and Obergefell has in some ways furthered and sped along some of the, uh, the advocacy group's efforts rather than stopped them. Um, why is that? I would submit it's because this is not merely a disagreement over what the law should provide or what the Constitution says or should say, specifically in a narrow circumstance. It's not merely a disagreement over what the law should accommodate, how it should be worked out in different situations between people who would say, let's sit down at a table and reasonably discuss uh, how these accommodations should be worked out between balancing interests. Uh, that's not the real issue here. Real, the real issue is a deep underlying cultural conflict between traditional Christian teaching on sexuality and radical individual sexuality defined by the individual who says, I want to live my life as I want to live it, apart from any authority, and who are you to tell me otherwise? So if that's true, and I would submit it's what's driving the issues we're seeing today, um, uh, it's going to bubble up, and I think it has bubbled up in many of the issues we're, continue to, we're continuing to see post uh, Bergefell. As I said, the ruling merely says that states have a requirement regarding the issue and recognition of licenses, but those are not the requests and demands we're seeing pushed in the public debate and the legal debate now. What are we seeing? We're seeing when a clerk or a public official says, um, I want to opt out personally of being part of this process. You can still get your license over here from this person in my office or this person in the next office. Um, thus, not denying the issuance of the license itself. People are still getting these licenses, but they have a problem with that clerk even opting out. Why would you have a problem with the clerk opting out? 
if the issue is the issuance of the license and, the, and obtaining the license, why do you have a problem with someone opting out? Because the issue is not really about getting the license. The issue is about approval driven by the underlying cultural conflict and demand for acceptance and recognition, which you're only going to get when that clerk themselves is forced to provide that license and cannot opt out. So we're seeing battles over the ability of individuals to opt out of these processes which violate their conscience. These are religious freedom issues. These are issues in which someone says, I need the law to protect me, the ability for me to exempt myself and opt out. And this is rooted in a long-standing uh, long understanding of U.S. religious freedom law, going, going back decades under free exercise interpretation, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. The law is applied to an individual context and says, we're going to apply a high standard of scrutiny to the government's regulation here. And if the government doesn't meet it, this person's individual rights are recognized and the government cannot burden their practice. This can and reasonably should be applied to a situation where a clerk says, I want to opt out of this. Yet these are the battles we're continuing to have. So law is driven by an underlying cultural conflict. Um, the law is often part of the game, but not the total game, but not the total... Uh, the, total fa the biggest factor in influencing what happens. Uh, years ago, the, the Boy Scouts won a case up at the Supreme Court level regarding their ability under the First Amendment freedom of association protections to um, drive their policy based on their faith and not have openly homosexual scoutmasters or troops. They won that case, yet in the last several years, they've actually voluntarily given up that policy and changed it. They had the legal right to continue to exercise their faith and have it enacted in their policies as they'd see fit. Yet, yeah, nevertheless, they gave up that right voluntarily, due in large part to cultural pressure. So the cultural pressure driven by this underlying cultural conflict um, affects how people give up their rights that they have to exercise. So we must protect rights for people who want to continue to exercise them, but their willingness to exercise them uh, must also be there. So where have we seen some of these demands post Obergefell? which, as I mentioned, the, the ruling itself has minimal direct legal implications, uh, but much larger, much broader um, effects on our legal system, driving the demands for acceptance and approval. How are we seeing this? Mainly in the request for non-discrimination laws around the country now, and non-discrimination policies, non-discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, to be enacted in situations which will produce a result of the government saying, no, you cannot exercise your religious freedom. You must be involved in this process uh, affirming same-sex marriage. Uh, so where are we seeing this? Just a, a few of the instances we've seen even before the ruling and continuing to ratchet up post-ruling at the federal level, the federal executive branch, um, EEOC rulings, the Department of Justice, Department of Education, federal contracting, uh, a lack of a strong religious freedom exemption in a federal contracting executive order, um, pressure on even principles under Title VII and typical religious exemptions. Uh, be, there's pressure to, to compromise those now, the threat of tax exempt status being revoked that was mentioned or argument last year. And uh, if, if schools and universities continue to say we want to live out our faith, threats, possibility hanging over their head of revoking tax exempt status, uh, we're seeing pressure on Congress to enact these policies in the military throughout federal court decisions at, state, at the state level, magistrates and judges being disciplined, sometimes for merely speaking out and declaring hypothetically they would not be part of a same-sex marriage uh, ceremony. A public employees fired at the state and local level for living out their faith regarding tr traditional Christian teaching on this issue. Small businesses, we know of these cases of, uh, in which wedding vendors and those serving the wedding, wedding industry are affected. These are probably one of the more concise um, examples of where the law already is impacting these folks. At the state level, you have non-discrimination laws, state tribunals and state courts. Judges are already ruling uh, almost uniformly that the non-discrimination law trumps the religious freedom claim. I think much of this reasoning is in, er in error, but we're going to have to wait for it to reach the Supreme Court, probably for that to be significantly corrected. Uh, other, other folks who have a nexus with the government, organizations, church organizations, schools, anyone with an involvement with the government, a point of connection with the government, uh, is being affected. And the government's saying, in essence, we're going to hang this over your head, and if you want to continue to do business with us and have the privilege of this public recognition, you must not discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. 
in the government's words. Now, what they're saying is your Christian belief and the ability to live that out is not as important as our view of fairness, equality, imposition of our norm of sexuality on you. Uh, and again, this is all driven from a cultural conflict uh, between these issues. So how specifically has this been happening even more recently? The drive in many advocate, on, on the part of many advocates is to equate a Christian teaching with, uh, on this issue with uh, racism. Uh, Christian, Christian churches, their line of reasoning goes, once we're racially discriminatory, that's been corrected. And they really believe that one day Christian churches, by and large, will, uh, w will not discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, will not live out their faith in this area anymore, will come to, to see the light and uh, no longer live out their faith this way. And they're proceeding along this line of reasoning. The Bob Jones case from the 80s that reached the Supreme Court is a, uh, a telling example. In that case, the Supreme Court said that um, a university could not retain its tax exempt status and hold on to racially discriminatory policies. And that's going to be the authority on which advocates rest their case. They can equate this with racism. They can rely on that case legally. And in the mind of the public, they have a strong case, uh, of course, for people who don't understand that these are not the same thing whatsoever. So that's going to be their push. You can see it recently in the case of Mississippi, Mississippi enacted a law which provides exemptions for those who want, not, don't want to violate their conscience um, when the government forces them to be a part of these ceremonies. So the Mississippi law exempts all sorts of actors um, who would be providing licenses or being a part of same-sex marriages, businesses, and folks in the public square. It exempts them from this. And the law actually explicitly says this can't be used to otherwise interfere with or deny the provision of a service which would be offered. So the law says you're going to get your services and get what you need from the government legally, even under a Burgerfell. You think this would be satisfactory to folks if all they care about is the same-sex marriage license and uh, uh, receiving those provisions and treatment from the government. It's not satisfactory to them, again, for the reason I explained before. This is not ultimately about a mere disagreement of legal accommodation, but rather acceptance culturally. And you can see this in some of the lawsuits that have been filed um, against this Mississippi law. The SCLU claims this law makes same-sex couples feel different. The law providing for an accommodation allowing folks to opt out of uh, these same-sex marriage makes same-sex couples feel different, puts them in a different class, treats them differently. Campaign for Southern Equality and their lawsuit claims that they may be treated differently un under the law. They're attempting to open up the Mississippi-related same-sex marriage decision post to Bergefell and have the judge solidify in that ruling that um, HB 1523, the Mississippi law, um, will not impact it one way or the other. Well, the truth is it hasn't impacted. No one's been denied any marriage license in Mississippi. Merely the presence of a law providing for an accommodation for the protection of an individual conscience is enough to get them to claim that people may be treated differently. Really, they know it's a spurious claim. They know it's a frivolous claim. What they're trying to do, though, is use the law as teacher, as cultural lever, pressure point, and have a court again declare in a way that would to make a ruling in a way that would look like it's suppressing and opposing those requesting accommodations under this law. And in that law set, they even request that anyone who would object to same-sex marriages must not issue any marriages licenses whatsoever. Again, why would you care about that if you're getting your license? It's, the issue is not getting a license. It's forcing everyone to conform to one view of sexuality. No one's impeded access to these licenses, yet these, culture, these accommodations are not satisfactory. This tells us much about the state of our country when it comes to the ability uh, to disagree and live together. Um, it's really not looking good, and we're seeing many of these battles, these legal battles, continue to play out right now. So basically, if you're summing it up, the issue, where we are post a Bergefell, Bergefell has made it much easier for those pushing for legal protections, uh, guys under in the guise of non-discrimination but really opposed to any exemption for a christian teaching religious liberty exemption in the law it makes it much easier for them to push for those uniform non-exempting regulations laws and policies across the board in all those areas i mentioned the federal state and local level it makes it easier for a progressive view of government heavy hand of government to come in impose this on people not provide any exemptions Mind you, not just for Christians, for anyone who exempt, who would, who would want to exempt themselves, Jews, Muslims, or otherwise. One of the other claims against the Mississippi law 
is that it somehow violates the Establishment Clause by exempting certain religious beliefs, and they cite and put forward religious people who support same-sex marriage. They neglect to mention the fact that this is not specific to Christianity. It would protect anyone of any religion who has an objection to this. Um, it's not helpful for the case, though. They're not going to mention that. So there's a huge battle strategically over the equating this with race and also chipping away and undermining uh, some of the issues uh, related to what Mark mentioned, undermining supporting the church, the Christian church, for uh, traditional Christian teaching on marriage and sexuality. So anywhere an individual in the public square has a government nexus, um, all those folks that I mentioned, the federal, state, and local level, anyone living out their faith in the public square, interacting with the government, in the marketplace of commerce, those are the folks who are currently suffering more now because of a burger fail. The pressure on them is greater. The legal, legal and cultural pressure on them is much greater because of this ruling. And while it's not at the doorstep of churches yet, it'll eventually be there if this reasoning continues. The line of reasoning logically is no limiting principle, which will prevent it from uh, one day allowing requests to take away tax exempt status of churches and um, uh, treat them the same way. So. That's just a summary of some of the legal uh, uh, implications of the ruling. And with that, uh, we're now going to open it up to your questions. So uh, feel free to, to fire away. There's going to be a microphone coming around and just identify yourself uh, and uh, ask your question. I think we got one in the back there first, and then we got three here. Yeah. So. Hey, I'm John Shelton. I'm with the uh, Southern Baptist Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, also from Duke. So I'm going to float between the Baptist and Methodist world. And I was uh, interested in why back before Obergefell, we didn't seriously try to get out of, get the government out of marriage. I, I know you've written on this somewhat, Mr. Tooley, um, but it seems like this is a trap we set for ourselves. Uh, it, that the, Perhaps we wouldn't have needed to worry about exemptions if we had just said the government does civil unions and religious institutions do marriages. Um, this is a solution, yeah, that Tony Campolo offered back in 2011 that you wrote a column uh, blasting. I was wondering, in, in light of the kind of tenuous situation of RIFRA laws, um, if, if you would kind of, if, if you would have a different answer today in kind of in light of Obergefell as well. Does that, the question make sense? Well, I would defer to my friend here who probably has more scholarship on this issue and expertise uh, than I do. I suppose that would be uh, not just Tony Campolo, but maybe an ultra-libertarian argument that the state get out of marriage although, oddly, most libertarians seem to support same-sex marriage, so I never understood uh, that contradiction. Um, I would just argue uh, maybe in some ultimate ideal uh, sense, uh, perhaps that would be desirable. I'm not sure that it would be, uh, but marriage is so rooted in civil law, dating back uh, to early common law, I just think it's too late and unrealistic to think that you could extract uh, the state from the definition uh, of marriage, and I don't think that would be uh, in sync with historic Christian teaching, although, again, I defer to the Catholic priest uh, uh. sitting next to me. But uh, I think that uh, the church, uh, universal, whether Catholic or, or Protestant or Orthodox, would say, would affirm that the civil state uh, has a responsibility to affirm and defend a male female marriage as for the benefit of the larger society and especially for the benefit of children. Would you agree? Well, I, I'll give you, in a nutshell, the Catholic view. And uh, just to clarify, I, I am a Catholic priest. I'm also a married Catholic priest, so I have some expertise on this. <laughs> uh, and, and a graduate of Wheaton College, so I can speak to the evangelicals here. But I think that um, uh, uh, Jesus, the Catholics uh, teach, elevated the natural institution of marriage to a sacrament. That is a, a part of our understanding of our relationship with God and St. Paul kind of expands on that and says marriage actually exemplifies the relations of the Trinity in some mysterious and mystical way. So understanding that, uh, Catholics don't think that government uh, can make marriages uh, understood by Catholics. In other words, we observe or witness sacramental marriage which only can occur uh, between among Christian between Christians right um, and uh, we would say between Catholics witnessed by the church but we recognize other forms so uh, that uh, express that sacramental character as well governments can't do that what governments can do and must do is to regulate the consequences of that dis those decisions and the formation of those relationships. 
for the common good of society. That's all governments do. Uh, now, can, two people can enter into a natural, uh, non-religious uh, contract of marriage uh, and can um, form that kind of relationship. Uh, they can't enter into what we call the covenant of marriage. Uh, in, in a covenant, in a contract, you agree to do certain things. The other party agrees to do certain things, and you build your life together. And we don't disparage that. That's that's a, a, a wonderful thing, uh, and there's a lot of grace and good in that. Uh, benefit for children, benefit for the people involved. Uh, but in a covenant, you don't just make a contract with someone. You give yourself to that person, and they give themselves to you. Uh, and our understanding of what Jesus taught is that in that moment, those two persons become in some way one, right? Their ontologies become a single ontology. And that's why Catholics don't even recognize divorce. Just to give you an example of how distinct we are, right? Uh, we, we acknowledge that the, the civil uh, authorities have this thing called divorce, but we don't recognize it among Catholics. Uh, and so in the same way, I think uh, same-sex marriage, we're going to recognize that, well, yeah, you know, the, the civil authorities in their um, kind of ignorance or l lack of learning about uh, spiritual truths are going to do this thing. We, we're not going to recognize it because it doesn't rise to the character of marriage as we understand Christ has established it. Okay, I think we had uh, three more hands that popped up, one up front here. And then we had, um, yeah. there was, we'll get to everyone. Yeah. Okay, I don't, I, yeah. I just, okay. I'm, just, I'm just, name is Dave Onstock, I'm just an individual. My question is sort of a general one, so forgive me. If the heterosexuals of this world are creating more life than social conservatives are willing to accommodate, um, as evidenced by the desire of these conservatives to construct billions of dollars of barriers along our borders to keep out illegal immigrants and anchor babies, why then, number one, do social conservatives continue to want to discriminate against those who are not heterosexual? And two, uh, do they, why do they continue to oppose uh, spending a fraction of that amount on family planning and birth control programs which aim to create fewer kids on welfare, illegal immigrants, and anchor babies in the first place? Thank you. Yeah, I hope that's for one of you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. There was a comparison between immigration and yes. the effect of marriage on society. Uh, uh, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's about primarily about sexual orientation in general rather than and, and procreation in general rather than the marriage specifically. Yeah, I'm not sure I can answer that. I think that in essence, you know, we're addressing the impact of this as a truth on the good of society, right. which we're we're addressing, we prepared to address. We're not getting into immigration matters we don't have a position on that so I'll you know that's that's that so I think we had several other questions here hi I'm Penny with CNS News um, the argument um, uh, for the people that, that uh, support same-sex marriage on the reproductive level they say that well what about all the people that are older and get married what about all the people that decide not to have children what about people who decide to adopt so how can the, the essence of marriage as an institution for children, how can that be made more clear, do you think, than we have made it? Because there's that strong argument on the other side about that reproduction it just happens to be part of what happens when men and women get married, if they, that they can reproduce. Thank you. It, well, it, it, when two people have sex, they don't always uh, produce a child, right? Uh, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, but it is prudent for us to be ready for those instances when it occurs and for them to be ready for those instances. It, not only prudent for them, but it is essential for that child. Uh, and so, yes, not every sexual relationship is going to produce children all the time. And some of them we can reasonably expect are never going to produce children. But as a general matter, uh, the uh, social arrangement or the social institution of marriage should be constructed in such a way so that 
such children as do happen to occur are cared for uh, as best as, as can be done. Uh, so that's the, the basic logic of that. The, the other thing to acknowledge, of course, is that even though uh, children, uh, we say an openness to children, uh, is an essential part of the relationship of marriage, it's not the only benefit or the only good uh, in marriage. Uh, uh, married people who uh, want children but never acquire them, um, nonetheless, uh, have many uh, possible goods in their relationships. They help to fulfill one another as persons and help to provide companionship and a complementary understanding of the world. Uh, and can, as you say, adopt children. Uh, I don't think adopting children is an accommodation to the lack of children. It's, a f it's an expression of their natality in a, in a particularly heroic and wonderful way. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think that that would be kind of the answer uh, that I would give to that. You may have a question or two over here. Al Milliken, AM Media. I, I was interested if anyone knows the churches that were named as far as, you know, accepting the LGBTQ community and uh, practicing, or, or I mean, performing same-sex marriages. When it comes to um, monogamy and say, say, you know, if you're welcoming and affirming a bisexual and you, how are they teaching and practicing as far as a bisexual entering into a, a marriage contract or covenant as far as, uh, as their view, as far as uh, how that plays out in a marriage? Um, I'm not so clear on that and, and I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I'm just curious if anyone knows how, how that's actually t happening now in our churches. I think largely by ignoring uh, the issue. I think what you're asking is uh, <laughs> the liberal churches who have uh, overturned the traditional Christian understanding of marriage, uh, are they open to other sexual and domestic relationships besides just same-sex marriage? And uh, I think they've largely kept that vague so far to my knowledge, but inevitably the march will be, how can you insist upon monogamy in a same-sex marriage uh, when others may have a preference or orientation for uh, other arrangements that are just as, uh, as pressing and also a justice issue? So you raise a legitimate question that hasn't been fully answered yet by the Episcopal Church and the Presbyterian Church USA and by others, uh, but they will be getting around to it uh, inevitably. If I can comment, I think a related issue is the issue of uh, uh, fidelity and uh, adultery in marriage. Uh, because I, I don't know of any laws uh, that seriously try to enforce those implications of the marriage covenant or marriage arrangement, right? In fact, we, we think that's probably an intrusion somehow if the government were to try to enforce that. And, and, and the fact that we think that tells me that we think of marriage as more a, a, a set of personal understandings than something that should be regulated by agreements. Uh, but have we not generally and usually understood uh, fidelity to your spouse to be an essential, uh, an essential requirement of marriage, right? Uh, and yet we don't really think that it's appropriate to enforce that. Now that's particularly appropriate to Obergefell because we know from long studies that uh, only a small minority of gay male marriages uh, are monogamous. Uh, the, the infidelity is um, a, a component of the, the large majority uh, of uh, uh, same-sex male uh, relationships, a little bit smaller minority, or not, we don't know so much, but it's a little bit smaller uh, among lesbian relationships. So here you have a form of marriage it, in which there's really no expectation going in that it's going to be a sexually faithful relationship, right? They call it, um, and, and what's the word, a psych, a psych emotional fidelity, which means you can have sex with people outside the relationship so long as you tell your marriage partner about it and you don't form any uh, uh, d deep feelings for that person, right? Uh, so uh, we've give, it seems to me that, that it, it, we can consider, we can think about that being a form of marriage only because maybe decades ago we gave up the idea that we would seriously try to uh, regulate 
uh, uh, fidelity or the lack of fidelity within marriage. So I, I think that one thing that's going to happen with regard to marriage is that um, uh, churches are going to get more religious about marriage. It's going to be based more upon the religious understandings of churches, less on the legal kind of structures of governments. Uh, but you might want to correct me. I don't know. Uh, my name is Will. I'm an intern at the Institute on Religion and Democracy. My question is, in the majority opinion in Obergefell, uh, it's written that uh, new dimensions of liberty become available to new generations, I believe. And so it seems to me like this line of reasoning can apply not just to sexuality, but to lots of issues. Um, if new dimensions of freedom become available to new generations, what does that mean, I think, for constitutional jurisprudence in general or any other factors of society. I just wanted to hear the panel's um, reactions to specifically that line of reasoning and what the ramifications might be. Yeah, I mean, I think the short answer is it poses many problems for our country. Um, submitting to you that um, the Constitution um, should be interpreted uh, with the plain meaning of the text at the time it was enacted, or at least something close to how the text was understood. Um, now that text has been expanded uh, to encompass far more than it actually protects or regulates and governs. And it's been, it, it's, that's been accomplished through that type of thinking and that type of reasoning and, and similar types of reasoning going back um, uh, decades and decades. You know, I think it really kind of started to pose a problem in the 60s when the Supreme Court um, really started grasping additional areas of of the regulation of society and claimed they were they were to be governed by constitutional rights in many areas, um, and, and the Supreme Court really hasn't been challenged on this since the '60s. Um, uh, by and large, our country, the other branches, the president, um, let it, the Congress has not stood up to the courts, um, uh, appropriating this power to itself in many areas, right? And, and so, yeah, you see it in this area, you see it in the area of abortion, you see it in the area of other constitutional rights, some criminal law, uh, property law, really just any, any area that could be affected by a mode of reasoning interpretation that says, you know, we must adjust this text to the times, um, or we must, uh, we must massage it, and we must practically, as a, as a pragmatic matter, um, rule on this in this matter in a way that's not clearly and limit and governed in a limited way by the text right so yeah i mean i think i think you know this is a con the reasoning you cite is a continuation of of the reasoning we've seen in some of the other er the the cases governing sexuality both in same tax conduct and um uh, abortion and, and even other areas um, but you see it flowing throughout many areas of constitutional governance and, and indeed and not even limited to constitutional individual rights but rather other constitutional issues, um, uh, and, and I think it's sort of infected the court's thinking um, in a big way, both in terms of expanding and, and really massaging the text, uh, but also grabbing power from the other branches in a way that has not been challenged. And uh, this leaves us with a, a dictatorship by the court in practice. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that that's a long-term, um, it's developed over the long term, it's gonna have to be corrected um, we have to be persistent in correcting it. Yeah. Um, I guess the bottom line here to me is that thinking about Obergefell is, is a statement that Kennedy made before the there, – there were sort of, you know, ominous interviews. One was in, I think, the New York Times Sunday Magazine or a Sunday article, and he um, – they were sort of doing this glowing tribute about his past, and all these things were revealed, you know, his, anyway. Um, but one of the things that uh, he, he stated was that, you know, in the flag-burning case, we basically crammed it down their throats. You know, they, these, these patriots, they, uh, these, these hobbits, you know, they basically, uh, you know, they, they, they like the flag, you know, and we told them that you can burn it, and uh, they just, they had to stuff it, right? And uh, his implication was that they're going to do the same thing here. So... Are the churches a bunch of hobbits that are just going to, uh, you know, kind of, kind of suck it up and roll over for the state on marriage and give up this sort of core teaching of, you know, Genesis two, very central feature of the Bible and all the teachings of Jesus on on marriage, or uh, are we going to basically say, um, uh, no, this isn't some trivial ancillary sort of thing that uh, doesn't matter. Um, and will this be the defining feature of who is orthodox and who isn't? 
Are the churches going to be become hobbits? Was that yeah, your question, <laughs> essentially? Well, uh, some have, obviously, but uh, very few. Uh, as I pointed out, maybe 5% of American church members belong to denominations that have been hobbitized, uh, probably less than that percentage uh, globally. So the only churches that have compromised their definition of marriage have really been uh, already declining liberal Protestant denominations in North America, Northwest Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, that's pretty much uh, it. So I've been uh, uh, not surprised, but still it's uh, uh, pleasant to consider that uh, the rest of Christianity, uh, even in uh, uh, North America, has largely, uh, at least officially, held firm to the traditional understanding of marriage. And uh, if anything, uh, the pushback from secular culture has uh, reconfirmed uh, their stance, which doesn't mean there's a lot, not a lot of squishiness on the edges. I mentioned uh, a growing number of um, evangelical or pseudo-evangelical uh, events uh, that uh, seem to want to either avoid the issue of marriage or to push the envelope uh, on marriage. But in terms of official church teaching, I think it's going to remain overwhelmingly uh, orthodox. marriage. Um, we were already well out of step with the culture with regard to divorce. Yeah, and if we held the line on divorce, despite all the people who left the church and the difficulties over that, I can't see that same-sex marriage is going to make much difference to us. Um, I, I do think there's a, a lots of hope in the fact that uh, religion is increasingly globalized. You know, most Protestant denominations started as national churches, and to the extent they are national churches today, they, they're I, they, they go back and forth depending on, on political um, leadership, uh, much more than those that exist in a number of different nations. And, and uh, you can see the um, um, religious groups in America that are part of a, a large global consensus just aren't going to give in on this issue. I mean, it, in, in Africa or in most of Asia, th this is not even on the table for discussion. Uh, so, um, so that's what I would say. Well, I think we're we're about one more question. Okay, we got one more, and then we're going to conclude. Uh, but we'll have other. We'll be here, and folks who have other questions can discuss. So, okay. you brought up one state uh, issue, which I run into a great deal, and saying when it's asked, it's not loving to confront them or tell them they're wrong. And I think your basic answer was. We don't get set the standard the way I relate it. Okay, I like to take them to the scriptures so I'm solid on it, not what I think, what I think. This Leviticus chapter 18 and 20 both says it's wrong, it's a sin, it's an abomination. And then how to deal with it, how to deal with them, I just take them to Leviticus 19, 19 verse 18. Do, uh, let's see, love your neighbors yourself. <laughs> That's an answer, and how do it? 17 defines that. Do not hate, in other words, love. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke <laughs> your neighbor, frankly. It says what that's what the definition of it is. And then if we don't, the sin of omission is there, that you do not share in their guilt. If we do not rebuke them, we are sharing in their guilt of what they're doing and not quoting what God's word says. Okay, well, thanks for that comment. I think we're, we're going to, um, did you have a reflection? Okay. Yeah, you know, I think we'll, we'll conclude on that. Um, I'll just provide a closing, you know, comment on that. I, I think uh, one of the things we haven't mentioned in terms of the religious liberty issue uh, being um, ongoing and it's going to continue is, we, we're, you know, we fight that in the legal world, the policy world, and the public Square, but these things are driven, as I mentioned, by that cultural conflict, and the cultural conflict over the long term, long term, going to depend on individual relationships, the ability to express truth and love to neighbors, friends, family members, those in our spheres of influence, those we're in contact with. And I, we know, I know, in my heart, everyone knows in their hearts, the, whether we're seeking that person's best, whether we love them, we're not compromising the truth, but we are seeking their best and continuing to try to share the grace of God and the truth of God with them. Seeking that for that person with a heart of love, not compromising the truth, is key 
to ongoing long-term relations, which will drive the cultural um, out outcome of this. Um, and that's our duty as, as Christians, too. Um, you know, I just want to mention that because that's a component to the cultural defense of the faith, which will bolster religious liberty. If the culture doesn't know us, what we stand for, what we believe, you can have all the legal protection of the world, and you're still going to fall short. So it's a both-end proposition. We must do both and fight the legal and policy battles for the good of, of fellow man, but also relate that personally. Um, I just encourage you all to do that. I've seen a lot of uh, fruit in my life as I've done that, even when I work here and sought out those opponents of me even, and they and communicated as best I can that I'm seeking their good, and I love them. And um, with that, I know there are a few more questions. We'll be here, uh, but we're going to conclude, and thank you for, for coming and being with us today.